From I Am Interchange, this is the Hatch Podcast Series. It is from the past that we are offered a glimpse of the future. And so it is with Co Palace in Switzerland. In 1942, with all of Europe admired in World War II, Swiss diplomat Felipe Motu wrote, If Switzerland is spared by the war, our task will be to make available for moral rearmament, a place where Europeans torn apart by hatred, suffering, and resentment can come together. Co is the place. When the opportunity to purchase the Co Palace Hotel arose in 1946, Motu and Robert Hanluser, with the financial and physical help of hundreds of fellow Swiss citizens, realized his intentions. The first conferences graced the palace's grounds that summer, and the co-foundation, now Initiatives of Change, was founded that fall. The nonprofit foundation has utilized the space as an international center for reconciliation, dialogue, capacity building, and hope ever since. At the close of June 2023, Thought leaders, activists, innovators, artists, and disruptors gathered at the palace to collaborate and commune in a Hatch Impact co-creation ecosystem. During the four-day peer-to-peer acceleration, attendees discussed project roadblocks, workshop barriers to access, and evolution, were inspired by speakers, and worked to develop achievable solutions capable of global impact. I'm Tate Chamberlain, and in this episode, I explore the nature of justice in the face of change with esteemed guests Ignacio Packer, Executive Director of Co Initiatives of Change, Douglas Drummond, CEO of Weaving Waters Collective, and Boise State University President Marlene Trump. When all around is evolving, how does equitable accountability define a just path forward? We're in Switzerland. Join us, won't you? Hey everybody, this is the Hatch Podcast. We're in Co Palace, just outside Geneva, Switzerland with the Hatch Europe Summit. And I've got Ignacio, Marlene, and Douglas with me. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thank you. Hi, Tate. Thank you, sir. One debate that I've heard a lot about around a just transition is around fossil fuels. There's a lot of pressure coming from larger, more developed countries who have not only gained their financial fortunes through fossil fuels, but also through like slavery and different types of acquiring land, whether it was purchased or stolen. There's this pressure on smaller growing economies to switch all the way to sustainable practices with clean energy, for example. So the unfairness, I think, to unpack that they're being called out on and that tension is you all had this opportunity to grow your economies and make yourselves have a better life. Quotes. Who's going to pay for this? We didn't make money the way you did. And now you're asking us to make these drastic changes. And so there's this pressure on the smaller growing economies who might not be able to afford this transition in that sense. What are the conditions needed for this change? I want to speak to something that you said about these deep histories. Because I think one of the things we're seeing right now is that in this political polarization, we're seeing people who are afraid to talk about history because they're afraid it will give them some ownership of a problem they don't want to have. That was somebody three generations ago. That doesn't have anything to do with me. That's not my action. And then we've got these deep histories that created certain benefits for some people, certain costs for others. And there's such fear about grappling with them. And that makes making the just transition very difficult. And I think that's why we've seen, that's one of the reasons we've seen these intense clashes is look at my history. No, look at right now, this idea that we can extract a moment and just look at what's happening right now versus if we understand those rich histories, how they change the way we think. And so I'm really, I'm hearing that in the things that we're all saying, this notion that there's, there's always a deep history that underlies it. And that's a part of what we need to grapple with in order to do a just transition. And what do we do with this history? I would say I, so I'm British born. So 
I have all the history of the colonial mm -hmm. uh, period, <coughs> which I have nothing to do with it. I haven't done anything bad about it. I'm clean, but I, I do, I, and I have to recognize of all what my ancestors have done and the weight that it represents. And that has to be on the table and it has mm -hmm. to be talked about. But the way we react and also around all the discussion around the fossil fuels is that we're managed by lawyers and by risk analysis and short-term risk analysis. So if you say that, if you recognize that, that is going to cost you so much today. And we have to be looking at the long haul. So how much is it going to cost us in the future yeah. of not recognizing mm -hmm. history and not finding ways of, of remedy? Yeah? Sure. And we are very much geared by risk analysis and by short-term thinking. I think a lot around education and what's coming up for me is around the sort of transparency part is that how do we at, at, the, at, the, at the very early age or level understand some of the system theory and way in which how these economies work and um, certainly on the global impact part are we being sold on goods and having a complacency around it and not knowing where their source from and where it's coming from and I think, Ignacio, part what you shared too about we are this generation and I realized that in the same this is an education and looking at early young people, for instance, young children. I think of my daughter, five years old. She's like a little system change specialist. How does this work? What does this work? What's this relationship to this? Like the science of baking cookies, for instance, and the outcome of making them and baking them and pulling them out and eating them. But yeah, I just think there is a bit of transparency around the systems change so that people can understand like how these things interrelate together. And I think we vote with our dollars, for instance, in a sense, and the power of people and consumer choice. Do Does everyone really know or does the collective, a critical collective, know the impact of our way we spend and the way we consume, how we support when I think of two of how people are willing to pay things forward, for instance, for instance, if you're looking at in countries where people are struggling or for whatever reason, fossil fuel is having a different impact than somewhere else. What are willing people willing to sacrifice and maybe being, oh, maybe I might pull back because I know the impact of this. Maybe I'll work towards more of a, a different form of transport, for instance, or how do we work on our communication skills so we can consolidate and carpool, for instance. But I think just the education around the interrelatedness of mm. some of these impacts mm. and the way that we can have a lot of autonomy to shift that in a really positive way, mm. I think would go some way in a sense, just understanding more intricacies of the problem mm. and the layers of it in a sense and how we actually are contributing. We actually are feeling inclusion to make just change around things. Mm. I like that, Douglas, to talk about the element of autonomy and what are we as individuals prepared to sacrifice. Yeah. I was recently in a meeting of philanthropic donors where there were two sessions around climate change and, and how the foundations are moving their programs and their grant making mm. to, to support very much more. And this was in, in Europe, in, in Croatia. And I asked, and I guess you all came by train, no? Actually, there were hardly any people who had come by train coming from Brussels, Paris, or, or, or Berlin. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean mm -hmm. in the fact of that question? What are we prepared to sacrifice mm -hmm. every day to be aligned with our values? Mm -hmm. if, we, if we say, yes, the business of the, the carbon footprint is important for me, for my organization, what does it change for my daily life? Mm -hmm. And even if it's only very small, but it has to be aligned with what we are saying. And, mm -hmm. we, and it's very difficult to be coherent in, in, as a consumer and, and so on. But how can we really align as much as possible and then put the pressure also then on, on policy, on industry to offer us a bit more the, the capacity, the, the space to be able to be aligned? Mm -hmm. What are we prepared to sacrifice as individuals? I'm, really resonating with this too. And I'm also thinking about a tension point with regard to this, which is that in the second wave of the feminist movement, one of the things that feminists were arguing was the personal is political. So what you are experiencing as an individual, one of the ways that collective action becomes, it can happen and can become significant is when people recognize that their personal experience is a part of a larger mm -hmm. pattern of 
of Mm -hmm. events. But the corollary to that phrase that a lot of people don't recall that second wave feminists talked about is, but the political is not personal and what they meant by that. And and so I want to actually say, yes, I agree. And what they meant by that is you can't only do the things that you're doing and think that's sufficient. Mm -hmm. So you can't just decide to recycle that can and then not think about anything else. And I think this is what you both were saying, but to call this out, you have to think about how the personal is situated Mm -hmm. in that larger Mm -hmm. context. And that's a part of the, the way that we must make change. So we have to understand our personal responsibility in that, Mm -hmm. but always understand how it's situated. And, and when we were talking yesterday, one of the things I said is there's this infamous case in the U S of a woman who was stabbed to death outside of a many multi-story apartment building. And everybody watched while she screamed as she was murdered and nobody did anything because they all assumed someone else would call the police instead of hundreds of people watching, calling the police. Mm -hmm. Nobody did because they all assumed somebody else must have. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to own that we have action to take. And I think we have to recognize that it can't be just us then looking down at our own actions. There has to be a sense of us as a part of a collective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, feeling like that tension point, Marlene, there too. Because, yeah, when things come up for us that are very important and how we get triggered, when I hear these stories and I'm just like, it's unfathomable to be like, how did this happen, for instance? And I hear these sort of murmurs, creaks and parts. I I work as a a chairman for, for the Big Sur Fire Brigade in California. And I hear this sort of pressure at times when people report an accident or an incident, then all of a sudden they are somehow implicit in this outcome or it's been there and the accountability and there's a sort of frightening around liability and things tend to spiral a bit out of control. Are those some of those forces that are there that create resistance to not want to lean in a little bit more? Either there is some emotional accountability or the the market force is so strong that they push us towards some unconscious ingrained decision to not take that next step beyond recycling the can. And I think a lot of that is some of that consumer pressure I was sensing from you in a sense, Ignacio, what you were sharing, that the way that we're marketing goods and petrol, we're trying to not necessarily appeal to our higher level of consciousness, but sometimes in terms of any of our buyer regret or buyer remorse, there is very clever marketing that's sort of helping to scrub that so that we can keep on going on a trajectory that's serving perhaps not directions that are better for the planet and each other, but more for um, big organizations and lots of for-profit capitalist movement. It's a little bit freaky for me. It's unnerving, in a sense, the power of those uh, forces in that kind of way that that are they really marketed in a way that are just yeah, benefiting individuals and corporations? And what are some of the truths saying that helps us see a bigger picture in terms of our wider relationship to the planet and its people? When I was eight or nine years ago, I was invited to the Valley of Consolation, which is 80, 100 kilometers out of Geneva. Don't quite know how I found myself in this group. We were about 20 and we spent five days together. There were... Um, specialists around environment and there were people guardians of norms and the norms of the religions Mm. so there was a rabbi there was a protestant head of clergy there was also a indigenous uh, chief from the amazon and and it was to talk about the situation of our relationship as human to to nature and you heard the scientists saying we're heading against the wall. They didn't have to wait for the latest scientific reports. They were saying it. We're just going really in the wrong direction. And then the people that were more holding the spiritual norms, or the religious norms, rather. Mm. And I, after the second day, I felt terribly depressed. And uh, these guys kept on having a big smile. It's a bit... I don't understand. And we're saying that humanity is at, at huge risk, and you keep on having a smile. And they said, the only way out is to work on ourselves, on our individual consciousness. And something would happen with the collective consciousness. So it's not about recycling the can. It's about aligning with values. 
and with our values. The collective is important and to make other people understand that there is no corner to hide on this planet and that we are absolutely all together is the the biggest challenge that we have. And as this group of a hundred hatchers leave today the core palace, that is the mission mm-hmm. that we have. And it's to go and to speak to people who do not think the same way as we do. And the pressure point, of course, is around having an economy which is human rights based. And that, that is one of the key entry points mm. that, uh, but that, of course, it was interesting. I think Pete said that in one of the sessions here at the Hatch Forum, that it was, I like, I prefer being thought as a dreamer than a, a, a septic, even if all the scientific data shows that we are really heading against the wall. Mm-hmm. We have to take that posture of being positive, working on our consciousness and just hoping that the collective consciousness will, will change something of the tragic trajectory on which we are in. Mm. Wow, that's so powerful. And I just am so moved by the way that you frame this as an, as an issue of people achieving consciousness in the space of collective consciousness. Mm. And I think one of the things one of the ways that we have experienced a different kind of wall is that we have in our efforts to demand that people understand the urgency of all the issues, all of the things that we're facing that have created moral and ethical and emotional and spiritual crises that are also now creating all these physical and material crises. There's been a kind of dehumanization of those who we would want to be our listeners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if we cannot, if we cannot meet the people humanely who Mm -hmm. we need to hear us, there will never be hearing. We, I live in a very conservative state in the U S and we founded Mm -hmm. a school of the environment. And a lot of people have been just thunderstruck Mm -hmm. that in a state like the one I live in, that we could have a school of the environment. And it's brilliantly interdisciplinary in a way that I think hatches where we've got artists and humanists and social scientists and not just scientists and engineers, which I think is critical because it's a part of that work. But we've worked side by side with the farmers and ranchers that, Mm. that are, you know, these, this really dominant force in the state because they know what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so our School of the Environment played a key role working with a variety of local ranchers because they were experiencing so many fewer water days Mm -hmm. for their herds. And we were able to help them rewild beavers Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. give them 21 additional water days. But they understand that there's an urgency Mm -hmm. to this work. And if we can meet them where they are and then talk with them about the implications. And I don't think it's just about selfishness. I think it's, I think it's about helping people imagine that their place in it matters Mm -hmm. and that they can play a role in a better future, which is, I think nihilism doesn't get us anywhere, Mm -hmm. right? It's Mm -hmm. the, why are people smiling? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because if you're nihilistic, maybe you don't care at all anymore. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't even throw the, aluminum can in the recycling bin. Mm -hmm. We can meet people with compassion and humanity. Then I think that we can have a different kind of conversation, even while there remains urgency. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking too, Douglas, about what you said about the cleverness and the density of the ways in which there's so much illusion Mm -hmm. and so much doublespeak Mm -hmm. that can make that really hard for people to see mm. yeah i think that how do we we create as much uh, clarity or as transparency in the face of so much complexity and yeah i'm a huge advocate of just how we explore maybe three levels of relationship uh, relationship to ourself um, relationship to another and then relationship to a group and 
they feel that they do arc or they do progress in a sense and and there's lots of intricacies in the way in which those three relationships play out together in a sense but when we know ourselves and i keep really feeling this coming back to what is our automatic advantage i'm a white facing cis male with indigenous ancestry in a sense but the way that i present gives me tremendous automatic advantage into this world and i really value in a sense understanding like where am i on this tree of support am i at the top of the precipice the mountain looking down i'm at the bottom helping pushing people up am i supporting guiding and my eyes ears mouth all closed shut off from whatever shame that i'm feeling about being isolated and then how can i lean into my sense of self to open up my eyes open up my heart and maybe open up my relationship to the unknown in a sense of what I would consider and could call spirit in a sense or nature and yeah how do I support those that perhaps that under these pressures at times have never ever had an opportunity to have any sense of perspective they're just at the the at the, the tip of the spear being plunged into whatever market forces are throwing them into for instance or dealing with tremendous oppression and suffering in relationship to another for instance how do we start these initial conversations of connectivity and starting to respect and see the values uh, within one another and then celebrating either the diversity of our emotion and then starting to celebrate the diversity of one another and then having that kind of confidence to start collaborating and then it almost shifts again from the inside out of looking at the wider collective in a sense and then what is the impact of our actions and how do we start to kind of plant those seeds of some of this pattern interrupt to start to create but more of okay hmm maybe we've been led a little bit astray or maybe this is where we are under so much pressure we can support each other or like mm. coming to hatch for instance oh my gosh there are other wonderful amazing people around that really share this deep love for humanity for each other and how do we make the world a better place yeah could be like lofty but in a sense also real the efficacy is really palatable in a really powerful way perhaps for you Douglas to perhaps because of your ancestors and so on to perhaps would you want to unfold a little bit more I'm sorry I'm, I, 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 am I playing your role here <laughs> no, that's good. <laughs> the, the relationship with nature and the divine because mm -hmm. we for the moment we you mentioned it a bit but we're talking a lot about us as humans mm -hmm. and what's the next layer and I, I don't know I would be interested to hear from you, Douglas, because of your ancestors and the proximity with, with nature and with yeah. the divine. Yeah. I think to create like the, the collective thread for all of us in a sense of what might be a connected or what might be a shared experience. And for me, always distilled down just to relationship to nature mm. and the system of nature and appreciating that and dealing with the life and death and the hatching and the unfolding in parts and mm. the way in which the ecosystems can reflect so much back to, for me, what is the great unknown of how these things are always interconnected like a, a vulnerable share for instance like in my deepest sadness at times my wife and i we've had 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 moments of wanting to have family and we've uh, my wife has experienced miscarriage before and having been part of that and something that deeply struck me is that family being such an important value for me and feeling so disconnected with like why is this happening and just feeling the up and down of it but then to be able to realize that this is a very natural process in a sense mm -hmm. and this is really how much life and death they're so close to the precipice of each other and in a sense of a circle like that just witnessing and seeing the nature of it allowed a spirited shift in me so profound and fundamental that i no longer on the outside of the cycle of nature but very much included on the inside of it too just seeing that part and the connectedness of that and obviously being in places with deep nature and seeing that and witnessing it that is a privilege for many people to see mm -hmm. that too in a sense but i think really that is like the ultimate grand conductor for me in the sense of the nature-based spirituality as a way of informing myself and also in those moments of great strife and great change and great heartbreak as well that, that there is a, a natural flow to these things and that's the sort of the calling to see that and to help perhaps support other people in a sense of how to find what we call like a mother tongue of this mm -hmm. or relationship to the elements and the cycle of that what distresses me sometimes is to think that we have the privilege of thinking in this way on our relationship to nature, no? Mm. 
New Zealand, Switzerland, <laughs> Montana. No, Why, yeah. uh, well, Idaho also. <laughs> Idaho, yeah. Montana, though. <laughs> yeah, 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 Montana. These are such a extraordinary places with what nature offers and so on. And then I think of the hundreds of millions of children who are born and raised in mega cities mm -hmm. where they would hardly see even a tree. Santiago de Chile, for instance, such a huge city with so mm -hmm. many children that only have a few parks where they see what green looks like. Mm -hmm. And the notion of a, a wild chicken is far from their, <laughs> from what they have seen and, and lived. So we live in so different worlds and probably things that would help me or my community to evolve would not be the same with other communities. So everything has to be really brought in terms of what is local and where the people are so mm. starting from, I think. And, and of course, uh, the relationship with nature of a child born in a poor quarter of a mega city is mm. quite some different than what my children have lived, born here in Switzerland, just two minutes from the lake and uh, three quarters of an hour from the mountains. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Mm. I'm curious to explore who's responsible for holding others accountable to transition. I just go like leap into this relationship to self uh, in the group. And I think fundamentally it starts within in the individual and to have a 360 degree perspective in a sense of looking at a light and shadow of things and leaning into the suffering of these parts and the way that we contribute to that and the way in which others contribute to our own leading into this tremendous ecstatic freedom and joy and privilege to be alive on this planet and to walking on this planet earth like that i think that starts to create an inherent sense of what is within our circle of influence and how do we become accountable we start to connect with like-minded individuals or ones that are not again light in the shadow then we start to begin to create accountability within one another or those closest to ourselves we start to open that up to the, the wider community of parts, and then all of a sudden we're starting to have a much, still this 350 degree perspective, but like the, we hear like the mycelium network in a sense of now that we have a tremendous amount, a pool of accountability. And then we, I think we can start to like break up and look at different areas of industry or areas that we have more influence or not and start to create that accountability with the people who have the rational competency of that and specialists in the field that are contributing that maybe have solutions or also have some ways in which they really can raise the hand up and saying this is where I can make some shift and some accountability and then start to educate others around it so that there is an interconnectedness so they don't feel isolated they actually feel very supported I think that's beautiful. And I'll tell you that I think, I, of course, the piece that I feel like I should pick up on is about the education mm -hmm. that you're talking about, because that's my job. And one of the metaphors that is often used for education is that it's this, it's the light bringer. It's the thing that allows people to encounter ideas they've never encountered. And encountering those ideas should create for you personal growth and that growth is always change mm. and and one of the things i think is really critical is that learning true learning and true teaching always involve each other so if you are a learner and you're not engaged in the process of also mm. teaching and if you're a teacher and not engaged also in the process of learning i think that there's there's a failure. It's not a one way channel. And I think about that with regard to, um, there, we are recognizing the ways in which our science, and I think about the smiling spiritual people at this event, we're recognizing the ways in which our science doesn't always have all the answers. And in, in Arizona, a state I lived in for a number of years, where wildfires, now wildfires have become a huge issue in the U.S., what we've been listening to on the news, globally they have, but what I've been listening to on U.S. news as I've been here is that air quality has been the worst that it's 
ever been in the U.S. because of wildfires in North America. Hmm. And one of the things that happened in Arizona when I lived there is that the scientists at the major universities and in the government entities went to the indigenous communities Hmm. and asked the question, and this really connects, I think, to some of the pieces that we've been talking about, asked the question, how did you control wildfire Mm -hmm. in the worst seasons in your tribal histories and actually benefited from that indigenous knowledge in terms of how wildfire management was practiced in the state of Arizona. And I found that fascinating. We've recognized that, for example, about medicines. There are indigenous medicine practices or indigenous food practices that can help us learn how to heal physical bodies, heal spiritual bodies, but also heal the planet. But that's we need that two-way channel to be open. So education has to be, as students come onto our campus, and this is students from every background, mm. we need to be able to hear them and not just... it. This is a part of that meeting people as humans in this critical work. Mm. If we just tell people what to do and we're not doing the work of meeting them as humans... Mm -hmm. then we won't have the benefit of learning from them and learning from their individual wisdoms. And I think one of the ways we really need to approach this and approach it as a deep practice is that every one of those students that comes to campus, every one of the individuals that we're grappling with politically, even when we deeply disagree, there are going to be things that we can learn from them and they can learn from us if we're willing to meet each other as human beings and not just as ideal, these flat one dimensional Mm -hmm. ideological notions. Mm. And that allows us to develop so much in the way of beautiful solutions and the way hatch very intentionally works. And I'm sure this is a process that's evolved over all the years that these summits have been going on is that, deep focus on the personal that was called a cracking open because otherwise how do you get to the place of doing that really Mm -hmm. big political work or that really big social work or that really big economic work whatever layer that we're working on and and so i think it's one of the reasons that i feel so pressed to call for the human, the spiritual, the engaged with the self, with, with those around us, and then with the larger collective. Yeah. 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 We take, at least us as we, we, I feel we have so much in common. We really mm. embrace the question of accountability, bringing it to us and to, as individuals and then to our community. But actually, the the real with the real world. <laughs> I don't say we're not part of the real world, but the the dominant force at the moment in our world is accountability to an economic system which is f- full of flaws. You know? and it's it too little is centered on the accountability to people, but more to accountability to systems where the reward goes through the shareholding or the growth of, of economies, the growth of, of sales and, and so on. Mm-hmm. And that shift and how like-minded people like us, and there's, of, the, of course, so many out there. Mm-hmm. How can we shift for the accountability to be indeed towards people and not towards an economic uh, system? Because that's how so many decisions are being taken. And it's certainly very, it gives a lot of hope to see how there are many, the Hatch and others, the groups in different forms that, that are moving in the same direction and that are more and more connected. Um, others that are perhaps more in silos. I have one of my daughters is very much engaged on youth movements and, and I was, I'm regularly concerned if I'm going to have to go and fetch her at the police station. But the focus is accountability for the future generations and not an accountability for the existing system.
It's a surprising and beautiful way this conversation has unfolded. I've really appreciated it. Mm. And one of the things that I'm thinking about as we're talking is we developed a program where we travel around our region and we've actually now had requests to do this in places far beyond our state borders where we bring together people who have very different perspectives, people who would Mm. in today's world often not encounter each other because of the ways in which knowledges get siloed and people get siloed. And, and to come back to the theme, Tate, that you've described that like, how does that even make just transition possible when people Mm. can't even engage? And so we've brought people together from very different backgrounds And what we call on them to do is precisely the process that you're describing, which is we ask them instead of saying, how do you think about this issue? And then creating a collision, we ask them, what do you value and why? Mm -hmm. And what the audience in this experience, which becomes active participants ultimately, what the audience of hundreds of people is required to do, there's no applause, there's no cheering, there's no, there's no, public response in that moment, we just listen. Mm. And each person comes up and says what they value and why. One of the very first events that we did, a man approached the microphone and he said, I'm a white male. I'm an attorney. I've been a politician. I'm wealthy, I'm religious. I'm conservative. You think you know who I am. Mm-hmm. And then he talked about his son having been shot in a drug deal mm. just blocks from where we we were speaking and listening. Mm. And it was, he said, you don't know who I am mm. until you know this. And there's so much more. Mm-hmm. And until we can hear and see each other, we will never have meaningful conversations. So in the wake of mm-hmm. hearing all of these people talk about what they value and why, then we create a communal meal that's shared in small groups Mm -hmm. and people have dialogue in response Mm. to that, what they've heard Mm. on the stage. Mm. And it is staggering how it impacts people. And it's staggering how it changes people's response. We had a, a young gay man in a, in a very conservative community who stood up and didn't disclose his sexuality until much later in the in his remarks but he talked about his success and his love for his family and his the activities he engaged in and he was a microbiology student at UC Berkeley in his junior year and he was very successful and then he said from age 14 to 18 I thought about killing myself every single day and the shock of that moment is what made it possible I think for the people in that room Mm -hmm. to hear him talk about his sexuality and not simply dismiss it as something other and to be rejected, but to walk up to this young man and embrace him Mm -hmm. afterwards. It was, and I think for us to find the space where we can see and hear each other, that's when, that's actually when I think we can approach justice and make justice possible in new ways. Yeah, I think that's really high on what we should be doing. And that's the creation of these spaces, these Mm. sharing the safe spaces and creating more safe spaces. Mm. In a couple of weeks time, actually in, in this place, we are, we're having a, yeah, an interesting moment with, with Russians and Ukrainians. Mm. Just three weeks ago, we had different communities from Syria. Mm. And the history of this place, which, so the core palace, which looks a lot at the creating these safe spaces for healing, goes back to 1947, where 200 Germans were invited to come up here to the palace to be welcomed as humans. Some of them were in, in the Gestapo, in the German army, but they were welcomed here as humans to discuss. In 1950, a group of 69 Japanese also came up here with the Japanese flag hosted. Mm. 
at a time where the Japanese flag could not be hosted in Japan, still under American whatever occupation, or to be able to host people as humans and for us to be sharing the, the safe spaces that we have and creating more of those. I think, as you've explained, Marlene, it can have such huge effects. The, the role model that this young man has afterwards, and probably at risk, I can imagine, but the, the message that he sends out to his community is absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. And if we, that, that has a, or can have a, a huge ripple effect, but also can also have concerns around security and so on. But, but, yeah, no, it resonates a lot, Marlene. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah uh, I'm sure I'm appreciating so much what you're both sharing. And Nasio, you know, sharing some of that little rich and beautiful history with happening here at Co Palace. And I enjoy working in these destination resorts or retreat centers and background places where they were wonderful and incredible for the current hosts and there were also some places many of them if not all of them especially destination places were also incredible and revered and, and honored by another population before the current host is there and that something Marlene you mentioned before around the, the indigenous aspect of that and what we might call in Aotearoa the relationship to the whenua, to the land in mm -hmm. a sense. And are there other ways in which other industry can create spaces of gathering that are not as unique as the places that we hear right now, which for some might say this is a place for the the aspiration, the privilege, in a yeah. sense, as much as though I bonafide really feel there's so much accessibility to come and being here and very grateful to be able to be in a place like this too. But when we look at, say, a pattern interrupt in hospitality industry, mm -hmm. there are beautiful places in the planet. It was wonderful for someone else before. Um, there is a yearning to want to return back to the origins and origin stories, especially if we are interested in scratching the surface around this relationship to self, other and the wider group field that we want to know where we came from a lot of the programming here i've noticed in hatch has been asking about that ancestry where are your mm -hmm. roots where do you come from and when they start to feel like for me on that spiritual intelligence part it is like a song it is a calling to want to come back to this place of origin and that pool and when that pool is owned by a private resort or something like that because it's a wonderful place and has the best views and the sweetest waters and the beautiful sands how do we start to create a bit more of that or a lot more of that accessibility and aspects and hospitality and being here and this affiliation with the Swiss hotel school, as much as I'm a Cornell hotel school graduate, <laughs> we have a little arm wrestle with that sometimes. But in the hospitality sense, it is like a Maslow primary needs in a sense of food, shelter and connectivity. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is an interesting way in which there are other places where people can gather in sacred land like that to have these kind of conversations to raise up all that level of frequency, ask some difficult questions like that, mm -hmm. honor the history, acknowledge the pains and sorrows, mm -hmm. and how do we work towards reconciliation, not as a transactionary process, but as a cyclical nature. Because yeah. often when we make, we, we come together in peace again, then all of a sudden we can fall over again, and then we have to come back again, and again, this is that beautiful play between this a trust and accountability and honoring the beautiful diversity in each other. Yeah, the many layers of where to create that safe space and starting by creating the safe space for ourselves. And then that enables also then to be more powerful in creating safe spaces elsewhere. And the safe space doesn't, of course, have to be, as you were saying, Douglas, doesn't have to be a, a core palace. Yeah. It, mm -hmm. It's at home. <laughs> yeah. And just, you know, and there's a little echo there too, is with some, they're talking, there are people here, family people here in terms of like, just, I just, you look in my daughter's eyes and being like, how am I going to be the very best of myself and the best, not always in the wonderful ways, but how do I deal with my, also my challenges too, in a sense of this accountability to self and how it, it can be deep Deeply, deeply rooted, deeply personal. Mm -hmm. And I guess like an ask out to community on however parts and we feel disconnected from something, like where is the gratitude and how do you go into this practice of saying what is it you're most grateful for and to ignite that little love light, you know, and throw some 
major kindling on a huge fire in our hearts or in our mind and our spirit to look what is it that we need to work on ourselves that is going to have a direct like a straight line or a circle or however we resonate in a shape to that which is most important mm-hmm. and then that ripple out wider and wider mm-hmm. and you do that Ignacio and Marlene embody that and exhibit that very well and I really appreciate and love that about you both mm-hmm. one of the things I'm thinking as we're talking that we're it's really disrupted this binary of thinking about the self as if we do work on ourself that somehow that's selfish because that's part of the piece of accountability because if we do that work on ourself then we have a responsibility to those relationships and those connections and that collective and that means that we can't just then it, it can't be a solipsistic process. It has to be one. And I think that's really a part of the theme here of that, that opening in and out and that seeing the connection between those things. They're not oppositional or a part of a binary. They're really, I love your metaphor, Douglas, of the water weaving. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's about the way in which as that work on the self happens, it makes us accountable to the broader world. And it makes us think about those relationships. And that's how I think that process becomes, we can do something that sets a rule or creates a structure or, and that won't necessarily change any of the practices underneath. The Supreme Court can make a decision as it did in U.S. history. Okay, now it's not legal to do X. And that doesn't necessarily change the local practices. If you're not doing that work, that Mm -hmm. deeper work, it doesn't make the change foundational and deep and rich and broad. It might change some public practice, but maybe not even a lot. And so there's a real, there's a profound sense, and I can see the way Hatch has taken this up, that work has to happen at that individual level in order for that broader engagement and accountability to exist. If we don't do that deeper work, and it is also about what we've been discussing here in at Hatch, initiatives of change is very much on it, is to look how complex issues are looked through the lens of finding technical answers mm-hmm. and the sustainable development goals put in place 2015 that all the governments have approved and so on. Mm. And now we say we're backtracking because of the COVID. We're backtracking because of the climate. We didn't expect it. We're backtracking because of the war in Ukraine. And there's a summit in September in at the General Assembly of the UN. And now those are the reasons that are presented of why we are backtracking. But the real reason is that we haven't put sufficient attention on the capabilities and the skills, individual, the inner development. And, mm-hmm. that, and that's why there are these inner development goals mm. that are complementary to the sustainable development goals. And this is, if we don't do that, that deeper work, as you were saying, Marlene, and that's what we have to bring all over. That deeper work mm-hmm. is needed to be able to address uh, complex issues and for them not for our our way of thinking as a society, not always be on the technical solutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or not only on the technical solutions. I don't want to Mm -hmm. say say that (laughs) that we we should forget about the technical solutions. Mm -hmm. So there's all this urgency in the world, right, to solve the goals. The 2030 is the goal for our existential ones, according to the UN, and we're on track for 2093, I think. So the question is, would you choose to be a dictator for a day or the slow pace of democracy can i disrupt that sure narrative which i think is we've heard here and douglas has even modified that further this notion that change happens at the speed of relationships and i don't even think you have to know someone well personally to have a relationship that's about this sort of humanization piece so i think being a dictator wouldn't necessarily fix the things that we want to see fixed. I think 
in order to make real and profound change. There's, and it can be breathtaking when we feel that urgency to think, oh my gosh, we've got to do this right now. And it just doesn't matter how we do it. It's not going to really fix anything if we don't have people meaningfully engaged and really meaningfully engaged means understanding means being a part of it means doing that work at all those levels. And so I think dictatorial changes wouldn't necessarily work in the long run. Mm -hmm. So pro democracy. I'm, I would even say the reason I didn't just lean into democracy is I think that there's maybe Mm -hmm. it's it, we have not been very successful. We've just gone into two camps or three camps or however many camps there are. Mm -hmm. We haven't been very successful at engaging with each other in that. And that's the thing we need to revive. Mm -hmm. How about you two? I'll throw a hot chili pepper into the pot just for fun. So I'll go, <laughs> dictator roll. You know, I think maybe there are some major pattern dis disrupt that needs to happen. I think really like leaning into and being identifying this overarching system of white supremacy and looking at it where it's like blatant, upfront, obvious, and make mass change for the day to be like, we're going to create accessibility to the fundamental physiological needs, fresh water, food, looking at aspects of education and how do we create the accessibility of those parts and then just looking at the ways in which we add benefits so advantageously from the oppressed to kind of hold our seat of privilege in the world. I think some of those things can be detonated in a way in a day that I think justify. Mm. Mm. Let's be and be aligned with our values and leave behind a beautiful dash between our date of birth mm. and our date of leaving terrestrial life. And democracy has to be protected. Human rights and the Human Rights Declaration was at the cost of hundreds of millions of people after Second World War. Mm -hmm. That is a treasure that we have to defend, that the economy has to be looking at a human rights um, economy and democracy. We have to put more integrity in democracy. And mm -hmm. I think with us, being is the most powerful way that we can move that and be aligned with our values. Mm -hmm. What brings you hope? <laughs> My daughter who wants disruption. Mm. My children who want disruption. That brings me hope. Even if I am on a position saying, no, you use the Swiss democracy if you want something, if you want to get something. I say, no, we have to be more disruptive. And mm -hmm. they are. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Being on a university campus, I see that all the time, right? One of the, when I was finishing school myself, when I was finishing college myself, my undergraduate degree, one of my friends said, well, what do you want to do? when you graduate. And I said, I don't know. I just want to stay here forever. I did. <laughs> and I think I look at young people and I see that they don't come into the world with the same things mm -hmm. that we did. And so that's why that learning process is so important. I want to learn from them too. And they are often very disruptive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fano, we call family. Yeah. The, you know, Tamahini, my daughter, Olivia give me major hope and yeah and myself too in a sense really trying to lean in a little bit Marlene saying that this what is the what we might call the selfish space which I think is something that comes out it is a bit of an oppressive force that we can invite in sometimes because if we cannot see and have a degree of self-love and self and to like learn to trust yourself in a sense like that I think that is really can be a challenge so I really can see some of the hope in myself but it's inspired by the relationships with other and then places like this coming together and community to be seen this has been seen by the three of you here and this group like allows me to open up and blossom in a way so mm. there's a cyclical way in a sense of that um, mm. that gives me tremendous hope this is the hatch podcast ignacio marlene douglas thanks so much for being here it's been such a pleasure mm. it's an honor and a privilege thank you thank all you. thank you all so much much love to you all much love to your beautiful community thanks thank you. you make me grow mm. thank you <laughs> good thank you Fundamental change starts with each of us, rooted in the individual. While some may dismiss introspection as narcissistic or egocentric, 
It is, in fact, a vital step in our personal evolution. This journey of self-reflection is what allows us to reconcile our differences, revitalize our communities, and reinvent our collective future. It's about taking personal accountability, ensuring that our own homes are in order so that we can contribute meaningfully to the greater good. But let's be clear, change begins at home, and we must examine tensions around our assumptions and biases to offer objectivity. Established wealthy countries, which have long profited from systems of extraction and exploitation, now face a pivotal moment. They must confront the uncomfortable truths of their histories, how they've thrived while others have suffered. Acknowledging privilege isn't just an act of recognition. It's a necessary step towards real change. It requires us to challenge our assumptions about race, religion, wealth, and the many labels that seek to define another. We must also examine the ethical implications of pressuring poorer nations, which have not reaped the same benefits from extraction to urgently transition to sustainability. It raises a crucial question. Is it just to impose this burden on those who have historically contributed the least to the problem? These nations often lack the resources and infrastructure to make such transitions. And asking them to do so without adequate support is not only unfair, it risks perpetuating cycles of inequality and exploitation. A just transition from the philosophical and physical pollution of an extractive ethos to the equity and nourishment of an inclusive one is made possible only when the responsibility, personal, national, or international, for what has come before and what must pave the path forward is not only acknowledged, but embraced. It seems now more than ever that we have found ourselves on the cusp of monumental worldwide change. Whether we consider the environment, politics, infrastructure, health, economics, or inequities across a broad swath of social constructs, the consensus is clear and urgent. All is not as it should be. The United Nations, a consortium of 193 member states from around the globe, agrees. In 2015, the UN unanimously adopted the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. These goals call for urgent action and global partnership to secure peace and prosperity for people and the planet, now and into the future. In alignment with the SDGs, Hatch, a curated network of artists, activists, and entrepreneurs working together to accelerate positive global change, has partnered with IM Interchange to fuse adventure journalism with experiential design labs to develop innovative solutions to complex global challenges. Hey everybody, thanks for listening to the podcast. If you enjoy it, please subscribe or leave us a rating. This episode was produced by Yara Craner, Susan Karstensen, and me, Tate Chamberlain. A shout out to our media and production team, Jessica Byerly, Darko Sevilla, Jacob Desch, Sean Mackinson, Amin Yarsu, and Zane Giordano. A special thanks to Yara Craner, Jared Silverman, Pete Strom, Aton Shapira, Rachel Hicks, Roshi Gavechi, Anya Bulis, Tania Sanders, Erica Mackey, Raymond Unsodegi, Mark Gurner, Elke Govertson, Ignacio Packer, Kyle McGrew, Eskil Bjorkestrand, Joshua Lesser, and the rest of the Hatch team and crew from Co Palace for hosting me. Thank you. With so much gratitude to the Hatch supporters, Steelcase, the Kaufman Foundation, the Gwydian Fund, Envision Equality, the Hatch Volunteers, Board of Directors, Hatch Guardians, and the community who helped make this work and mission possible. To learn more about Hatch, visit hatchexperience.org. Building community could not happen without food. And with that, I'd like to thank Whistle Pig Korean, Red Tractor Pizza, and Zocalo Coffee House. Do you have an issue that's riddled by gridlock in your community? Shoot me an email at tate at iaminterchange.org. That's tate at iaminterchange.org. Remember, share airtime and don't ruin dinner.